Hello everybody, thank you for uh, joining my talk today. I am very glad to have you here and to present in front of you. My name is uh, Alexander Zafirov and I am a lead data engineer uh, at Leo Pharma. My passion lies in data and that's what I've been focusing on in the past five or six years of, uh, of my career, traditionally a software engineer and now in the field of data. This talk is a long one, so let's get to it. If you look at the, the title uh, of the talk, there are many words that uh, jump at you. So to demystify a bit, what I will be focusing on is clarifying what data ops is, building a framework that we can use uh, to cross-reference that against the pharma context. And of course, this is something that we're working towards. So showing you the short-term perspective on how we develop. Data Ops is uh, the first section that we will cover afterwards, as I said, Leo Pharma's cross section with Data Ops and afterwards, yes, further steps. Data Ops is just an umbrella term for, um, Data Ops is just an umbrella term for established methodologies that have been uh, around for quite a while and applying those to data uh, shows tremendous value for both company uh, and uh, personnel. So uh, the goal of it is to produce high quality data assets and uh, update the life cycle time um, of, of those uh, data assets. Main benefits, increased rate of innovation. Um, every company wants that. Of course, you have the cost and time that it takes for a given data asset to be generated that get lowered. Um, and keeping track of what's happening within the space that the company um, operates in, uh, that is enabled to data ops. And finally, um, it is about the collaboration and work reuse that happens within um, within the organization. The practices that I spoke of, uh, we'll go uh, in depth uh, into each and every one of them. First, we start with DevOps and the relevant things are everything is implemented as uh, soft, source, source code. Um, you have the versioning that happens so that audit logs are tracked uh, on what, who, and when uh, has done. And of course, testing uh, in order to ensure that deliverables are maintaining backwards compatibility in respect to regressions. Automation in deployment, um, um, automation in testing, automation in verification, basically everything becomes a process that gets uh, enforced on uh, newer changes. Um, and of course, being able to decouple different uh, different uh, workloads is very important. So those can happen in different environments, in isolation. Agile is something that many of us know, I'm sure. But what is relevant is having uh, empowered teams with clear responsibilities that allow uh, to, to move fast and of course have very quick uh, iterations with, uh, at each of which they, um, the team intersects with the business in order to gauge how well they have been performing. Statistical process control comes from lean manufacturing and it's about measuring the quality of the data but also the data pipelines, um, the KPIs and we are going to get into those further on. And on top of that we have alerting that allows us to take manual actions whenever necessary. The data itself uh, requires uh, several things, one of which is um, domain-driven design, being able to model the software as close as possible to reality. Um, whenever you have, of course, uh, these data assets that we're looking for, they are part of a longer chain of um, changes and those upstream and downstream consumers and producers they need to be alerted of how things have been happening. So in that sense, the data lineage is very important to be built. Um, and of course, feedback loops, whenever 
the the goal is there the data asset is there it can be reused or it can be refined and so getting that back into the beginning is uh, is an important concept that needs to be addressed quickly about the innovation pipeline uh, so value innovation pipeline this is the intersection between when the data comes in it gets data analytics applied on top of it to produce some kind of value so the horizontal plane is very much a structured process um, that is mainly about the data coming in and going out whereas on the on the vertical we have the traditional software practices that allow uh, data analytics to be developed in uh, with respects to agile and the devos movement that we already highlighted from the development perspective, we need a sandbox, gener a sandbox environment that can host um, that can host the development efforts, and again in isolation, with of course uh, the GDPR, PII, all the requirements, so that the data doesn't contain any sensitive information. The development happens afterwards uh, with the proper version control, and of course we have the automation that. Uh, does the building, does the testing, continuous integration and delivery is what we want so that we can roll out features on a good cadence. And of course, orchestration comes into play whenever we have the data pipeline and all the steps that need to happen. And then get they get the statistical process control applied to it. When the data gets out there, we can, of course, catalog it. And as we spoke about the feedback loops, we can uh, get that out there and people can view it, make it discoverable, make the data asset more than just uh, the per fit more than just the purpose it was made for. And we need to have monitoring on the data asset quality itself, but also on the pipeline as we spoke about. The organization uh, gets many benefits. One is the DevOps movement, which is on the horizontal plane here, where we have uh, development and operations working closely together or sometimes be that same role. But of course, we have on the vertical axis, we have the local pockets of innovation, um, be able to generate something new, something great, and then bring that up to a centralized team, uh, which can scale that across the organization, then that cycle can continue on. And, for, uh, and finally, what are the people who are working in these teams when it comes to the data process? Well, we start with the subject matter experts, who, as you can see on this um, spider chart, are mostly uh, experts on their business. Uh, as the title implies, they need to get the insights and they can give you the criteria. Data stewards are the same people, but with the tech uh, capability, they interface with data engineers or scientists to make sure that the right processes and the right data is um, generated and found um, the data engineer is the workhorse here, uh, I know that very well. Um, so the data management skills, the software skills, they all need to be there, but of course you need to have a bit of understanding of where the data is and, and uh, how to work, that, uh, work with that. The data scientist is the rock star, they gain, uh, they find the insights, uh, they apply the algorithms and statistical approaches. But of course, uh, without the ML engineer or the cloud competences, uh, there is no possibility to scale these ML products. And that's what we see that a lot of uh, companies are going towards right now, the MLOps movement. So having that framework, uh, let's look at Leo Pharma and where we are and where we want to be. Leo Pharma, a leader in, in, leader in medical dermatology, a company that has existed for more than 100 years and has a proven track record of products. Data in the pharmacy domain is central, um, but unfortunately that data has not, and is still to some extent, not digital, and that's where we face some challenges, of course. The faster time to market makes all the difference in the world because of, first of all, the humility aspect, helping patients, um, and of course, um, with our drugs and of course um, the first one to market their uh, drugs their product is the one that gains the most out of the um, out of the market so based on that we have high ambitions for 2030 and that is of course double digit growth but we also want to be um, at the top of the medical dermatology and we want to do that 
uh, with a cadence that goes from 10 to 2 3 years um, which is a radical improvement in the pharmaceutical space digital is high on this agenda and uh, looking at that we have the considerations where we have a scattered landscape like many corporations but we benefit from the fact that we have many many scientists that are bioinformaticians statisticians that have the scientific method up their sleeve unfortunately the competences and ownership of data is scattered across uh, the traditional it structure that many companies have and r d in our case and of course because we are in the business of making molecules and turning them into drugs for patients we have the constant agenda again uh, of buy versus build and sometimes we need to wait in that context here is where my team comes in uh, the um, research and development data and analytics in leo pharma we are that competitive edge we are uh, the ability the competence that the line of business is lacking and after we have established our trust in the business now we see that there are many potentials and we need to aim for the best bang for the buck so to speak and um, yes as we have a growing portfolio we also have a growing set of challenges but let's look at how we intersect with data ops so first the practices we have uh, azure devops so we are users of azure and the microsoft suite so azure devops is that intersection between work and processes and for us in this context is the repositories is the pipelines is the wikis um, all these all these uh, practices when we have data bricks which is again uh, the word workhorse uh, when it comes to anything analytics anything scalable uh, i will talk a bit about databricks again in a couple of slides then we of course we have terraform because as i said infrastructure is called everything is called we would like to be able to reuse as much as we do uh, since we are not a big team and we would like to kind of leverage um, managed services as much as possible and of course, in collaboration with IT, we have generated subscriptions that adhere to security standards. The agile practices are there and of course facilitated through Azure DevOps. Um, statistical process control, I would like to focus quickly here. Uh, so on one hand, we have Azure Data Factory, which is the macro scale where we pull in different um, assets from the Azure space and we orchestrate them and we get the bells and whistles that we would like to like emails alerts notifications uh, reaching out to different uh, sources and resources moving in and out of different uh, formats and of course the delta life tables which is a bleeding edge technology that um, databricks has recently introduced uh, it gives us all the benefits that you would like to think of as a data engineer when it comes to data pipelines it has lineage it has uh, statistical process control in the form of expectations which allow you to gauge what data set should be allowed through and what not we have the seamless conversion between stream processing and batch processing and of course we have the metadata of what is happening in uh, in our in our pipelines and this is very valuable even though the technology is a bit immature right now we are placing our bets on it and we know that we are going to reap great benefits because it integrates tightly with the um, Dell Databricks infrastructure and leverages the lake house architecture in the data side we have procured Colibra it is not there yet and we're going to talk a bit about that and of course we have uh, the collaboration and the processes of bringing up people in the data steward position because that is an added um, responsibility for uh, many people that uh, they need to figure how to put in their day-to-day -day, which is also a challenge on, orga on an organizational level from process perspective if you look back at the diagram we see that we are missing some things the ability uh, to create sandbox environments because of the security because of not replicating data and all these kind of things we're still thinking about it orchestration uh, yes uh, the gui based approach of uh, azure data factory and the generation of json underneath does not help us much and we are trying to figure out what are the best practices there open for suggestions absolutely um, yes data cataloging we are ready for it with the delta life tables but uh, of course we don't have the catalog yet and we have basic monitoring in place which is a topic that we will address in the future we have the whole journey uh, from basically ideation to presenting it to users with eye candy 
and all the verticals of security and compliance in place, uh, not to mention the data. So we are ready for many of the challenges. But speaking of challenges, what does this approach yield us? Where two main things that we work in separate subscriptions and the work that we do is custom tailored to the specific solution. So in that sense, um, we cannot have reusability or we cannot allow people to discover because that's, that's the whole process. And we cannot leverage the learnings. So that is not good. And on the other hand, we have a toolbox that's very technical. So the barrier is low. And of course, we are putting pressure on ourselves because people cannot have self-service. And at the same time, the operations is on us, which is not what we want and not what we are made as a unit. Our collaboration is limited. And of course, processing capabilities for people like using Excel keep on being limited and the data set keep on being uh, small. So Snowflake to the rescue. Many people have jumped onto the Snowflake bandwagon and so are we. We are currently procuring it. And for these primary features that it's a platform, it's another level of abstraction that we need it because we cannot issue people or many people are not comfortable with receiving a um, storage account and running with it. And of course, we have role-based access control connected to our Azure um, Active Directory, which gives us that um, segregation and ability to give resources and compute as necessary. Data collaboration, reuse and refinement is coming out of the box there. And that's great because we don't need to think about how to give those and how to make them accessible with uh, all the infrastructure that we need to build otherwise. And of course, the Snowflake has become a de facto standard when it comes to being a sink or a source or an intermediary step for that matter. So a lot of tools have it as a connector, uh, have connectors for it. So that, that was a no brainer for us. And the other part, uh, well, there is a lot of process and of course a lot of work on our side, but what we need to do is we need to make sure that we teach and evangelize on the good sources, the good tools, both on a very technical perspective, but also on low, no code tools. And I'll give you an example in the next slide. And of course, we can slice and dice all the work that we have done so far. So from the, from the perspective of security and compliance, we can give infrastructure as code, prepackaged software components, because as I said, we have the whole journey and we can give it to everybody. And of course we can, we are building a central location where a lot of the people can showcase their work and allow for others to collaborate across the organization. This is where we are. Uh, we have Snowflake underway and Colibra. NIME is what we are evangelizing right now against. But of course, uh, we have Databricks, uh, Azure Data Factory and Azure App Insights, uh, Azure Insights. And uh, the next steps that we need to undertake are uh, making sure that we finish the, the journey with Snowflake and Colibra and uh, focus on the low and no code tools. Um, afterwards, we are going to look at uh, the monitoring and right now the conversations are with Datadog and Sentry. I would like to uh, thank you for uh, watching this video and I'm very grateful to the organizers of Data Innovation Summit. We have one role right now, which we are currently hiring for. So please reach out. I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding DevOps, um, DataOps, MLOps, and of course, all the work that we do in Leo Pharma. Thank you.